everybody, this is Lucy Nathanson, child therapist and founder of Confident Children at Coda UK. I am really excited that today we have Jonathan Colmeyer here. I'm going to be interviewing him about his experience of having selective mutism as a child. So Jonathan has experienced selective mutism and he's actually written a book about his experience. experience. It's called Learning to Play the Game, My Journey Through Silence, which I read a couple of years ago, actually. So, um, yeah, I recommend that um, anybody gets this book if they'd like to learn more about Jonathan and his experience following watching this interview. And Jonathan and I actually met a few years ago. We both took part in the We Speak programme, helping children with selective mutism in New York a few years ago now. So it was great yeah. to have you there and now to have you here with us. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, me too. So let's get started. Um, so... First of all, between what ages did you actually have selective mutism? So I was thinking about this question, and it's it's actually more complicated than it might seem. But I would say that it started from, I guess, birth. Um, whenever I started talking, I was always anxious around people. Really, we kind of noticed it in preschool, where I wasn't so talkative around other kids. I, I wouldn't talk to other kids. I would talk to one of the teachers, but only like if we were in the corner. But once I got into kindergarten, that's where I completely stopped talking. And I guess we'll talk more about that later. But when I stopped having selective mutism, that's where I guess it becomes more complicated. Um, I probably could speak to anybody who asked me a question by the time I was nine, maybe eight. But time when I was comfortable initiating with people, maybe 13, time when I was comfortable with friends, maybe 17 time when I was like good order in restaurants, maybe also like 13 or something. So it really depends on an end point there. I still struggle with anxiety today. I don't technically struggle with selective mutism, but that's, so that's why it's kind of complicated. Yeah. So it's almost like the different points in your life where you struggled with different parts of talking and also depending on the talking that was required, I suppose. Yeah, but depending on how hard the challenge was. Yeah. Because somebody asked me a question, I think that that was more easier for me to do than me actually asking somebody else a question or doing a presentation in class. Those all came later on as I guess progressed further. Mm, of course. So, but would you say that throughout your school years, there were elements of SM at different points? Um, I would say so, yes. Well, at least social anxiety, definitely, throughout school, throughout college, throughout, still today. Um, but the, my most severe selective mutism was pretty much when I was five to maybe eight or nine. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really, I only stopped, I would say, because I had uh, treatment. Um, should, I talk, should I talk about that now? Um, should we? Yeah, it, maybe if you could tell us, first of all, like, um, like with whom were you able and unable to talk during that time? Yeah. Um, just so that the viewers have an idea of your, the, what your SM, how your SM yeah. presented, perhaps. So I guess the most dramatic way to show how my SM presented was my first day of kindergarten, I walked into my classroom and I couldn't walk past the door of my room. I would stand underneath the light switch right next to the door. And I couldn't move from that spot. I wouldn't sit. I wouldn't eat, drink, use the bathroom, participate, sit down. I couldn't talk to anybody. Somebody came to interact with me. I couldn't speak. My face was pretty much like concrete and I couldn't pretty much do anything. And I would, I was, and nobody really knew what was happening, but now we would say that I was so paralyzed with anxiety that I just couldn't speak. I couldn't do anything. So that's really how it presented itself then. Um, but so in general, I couldn't talk to any peers. I couldn't talk to any teachers. Um, I couldn't talk at restaurants, even if I was out in a crowded place with my parents, I wouldn't be able to speak at home. Of course, I could talk to my parents, talk to my brother. Um, there were a few like family friends that I had known since I was born that I was able to talk to. Um, but if there were people who I only saw once in a while, some family members I only saw once in a while, I would be very wary of talking to them. Um, anytime I was really out in public, if I saw a stranger, I, wouldn't, I couldn't speak to them. Um, so it's kind of very select few people who I would talk to when it started. Yeah, 
And that, that sounds really quite typical of children I work with um, who are able to speak to close family at home, but you know, outside of that safe space, that's when the anxiety affects them and they're unable to speak. And also, I like that you mentioned that, you know, that you, the other areas of the way that the SM affected you beyond just the speaking, yeah. you know, being unable to even go into the room and um, participate even in non-verbally, because I think that's sometimes a bit of a misconception that it's just speech when actually yeah. it can, it's so much more than that. Yeah, sometimes I would be able to nod my head, but a lot of times I wouldn't. Um, it was really all aspects of social communication or even anything to do with being in public. Um, I was also diagnosed with social anxiety when I was in second grade. So a year or two after I was diagnosed with SM. So sometimes it's hard to disentangle those two. Yeah. Um, but it, it affected me in pretty much all ways, not just speech. Mm -hmm. And this might be quite a hard question to answer, but I think, um, is really useful for viewers especially if they haven't yeah. experienced sm themselves could you share with us what it felt like to have selective mutism how you felt in those different situations where you're unable to speak i have I've thought about this question a lot because i've done some interviews or presentations before and people always ask this question oh really when i speak to parents they always ask this question and i think the easiest way to understand it i don't know like scientifically if this is what it is I would say that it's basically a fear of talking or a fear of other people. So if you think of whatever your worst fear is, whether that's spiders or snakes or heights, and let's say you're incredibly fearful of, of spiders, which I, I am <laughs> separately from. <laughs> so just put yourself in a situation where there's a room. Just imagine yourself being in a room for, full of spiders. Imagine like your heart rate going. Imagine that kind of rush that you feel. I want to get out of this situation. I need to run away from this. Um, maybe start to get sweaty and maybe start to get dizzy. All of those things are things that I felt when I was around other people and I needed to, to speak. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's easy for everybody to understand if they think of whatever their biggest fear is and just imagine having to look at that. Um, another thing that comes from that is people ask me, what was I thinking when I had selective mutism or I was in these situations? And if you think about when you're in that, if you just imagine yourself in your room with spiders, there's nothing, at least for me, there's nothing going through my head when I see a spider around. It's, mm -hmm. I need to get away from this immediately. And mm -hmm. I think for me, that's what it was like when I had selective mutism, social anxiety. So I just need to get away from this and I don't want anything to do with it. But there wasn't that much going through my head in the moment. Um, maybe after the fact, I had some thoughts about it, but really in the moment there was, Pretty yeah. much nothing. It's just fear. Yeah, you're in that like fight, flight, freeze response where the thinking brain just shuts down and just, you know, you just need to fight or flight or freeze. To, exactly. Basically. And there's no, you know, you can't think. You're, you're, you don't have capacity to think in that moment. And that's, I thank you so much for giving that analogy because everybody has a fear. So everybody can imagine, you know, this, if we're watching this, can imagine what they're scared of, but amplified, you know, if I'm yeah. just have one spider in front of me, I freak out. So if I am thinking of a whole room is, yeah, yes. um, it's a really nice way to help people to understand. So thank you for that. Um, so how did SM hold you back or impact your life at the time? So when I, when it first kind of was most severe, it was pretty much in every way possible. I couldn't, when I was in school, I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink, couldn't sit down in class. I stood up. I couldn't use the bathroom. I couldn't speak to anybody who spoke to me. Um, of course, it was very difficult to make friends. Uh, sometimes people would like try to interact with me and I would laugh or giggle silently. Um, but, and sometimes of that I enjoyed, but really I wanted nothing to do with, with people. And I wanted to go home whenever I was at school. Um, so really, it, there was no part of my life that it didn't touch, especially when I was little. As I got older, um, it's hard to participate in class, hard to present in class during school projects. Um, things like gym I could never do, 
band class, art class was very difficult, anything creative, anything competitive, anything collaborative was very difficult. Ordering at restaurants, being able to go other places without my parents because I couldn't like advocate for myself. Going to school nurse was difficult. Pretty much any way you can think of it, mm -hmm. it was a challenge. Of course, with therapy, those things got easier slowly. But in the beginning, it held me back with everything. And I, when I was in elementary school, they, they kind of misdiagnosed me with lots of things. So first they misdiagnosed me with, I think, oppositional defiant disorder, saying that I was doing all this, these things like on purpose. Wow. Um, or they thought I was, I was being willful about it. Um, also diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. The school actually told my parents that I was going to be that way for the rest of my life. And they didn't think that there was a chance for me to get better. Oh my and they God. actually, yeah, crazy things that you would say to oh. somebody's parents. Yeah. And they recommended like they, that they transfer me to like a therapeutic school where I might be able to get more help. Um, but we, we didn't, my parents were, were not for that. Um, I was also diagnosed with autism. Of course, we didn't really think that that fit because at home I was pretty much fine. Which is not what you would see with autism. You would see these things kind of persistent in all situations. Yeah. And I was also diagnosed as being like developmentally delayed because school didn't even know that I could actually speak. And I received kind of extra help throughout um, elementary school. Some of it I would say probably needed because if you, if that, that experience I told you about not sitting down and not being able to participate in kindergarten happened for, for months and months. So basically I would say I missed kindergarten. I missed preschool for the most part, besides just standing there. So I did have some, I would say educational things that I was behind my peers because I couldn't participate and I didn't do these things. So in that ways, I would say it held me back as well. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. It's really useful. And also, you know all the diagnoses and I'm I would hope I'm assuming this is I, I don't know was it ha, approximately how many years ago this was like 2001 so I would hope things are better now so 20, yeah so I would hope that children aren't misdiagnosed anymore uh, because you know a child with SM when they are in that high anxiety state may look like a child um, an autistic child but actually if as you just said autism is persistent the child is does have those traits across situations regardless of whether the anxiety is yeah. high or low um whereas a child with sm when they are at ease when they don't um when they aren't anxious they don't present as a child with autism so yeah. i would hope that now um assessors would look at across situations look at the child assess the child across situations and not just when they're highly anxious because of course that can lead to misdiagnosis one one of the most interesting things about selective mutism, I think, is that it's one of the one of the only um, mental health issues disorders that is different depending on the situation. Because, like you said, if you're autistic, you have the same kind of presentation in almost every place. It's not the same because, of course, your anxiety, your abilities, kind of change from situation to situation. But and if you have generalized anxiety, you're anxious in almost every situation, or you worry about almost everything. Your social anxiety, you're socially anxious about almost everything. Um, but selectomutism, it's so situational dependent where I could be in a park and if there's other people, I would completely shut down. But if I was in a park and there was absolutely nobody there, I could be not as comfortable as I was at home, but at least somewhat more comfortable. Yeah. And I think doctors, when they see a kid come into the office or teachers, they see a kid at school, they think this is the way the kid is. They're always like this, but that's not true. And I think that makes it very difficult to diagnose SM or say, say what it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's really an interesting point. It's one of the only, if not perhaps the only, I don't know, yeah. condition where it depends on the situation. Exactly. Um, and as you say, of course, other disorders may be amplified when they're under stress, but there wouldn't be such a marked contrast yeah. between presentation mm -hmm. so and um, how when you were at school how did your peers react to your selective mutism 
um, especially when I was very little, they didn't react as much or I mean, at least I didn't like get picked on because, because we were all five years old. So mm. they kind of, they, sometimes they think it was interesting. Um, they would come try to interact with me, try to talk with me. Some of the kids actually didn't know that I was physically able to speak, which mm. is somewhat interesting. Um, but there were kids who would like come up to me and I would, I guess they would try to be friendly with me and that I always appreciated and kind of made me laugh at times or if they would try to talk to me. I'm not really sure why they kept trying because I didn't really provide any input with them, but they were very nice about it. Um, like when we had a substitute teacher come and they didn't know that I didn't speak and they would call my name for attendance. Some of the other kids would say, John's here, but he doesn't talk. So things like that. Or, but yeah, but as I got older, it became more problematic, of course. I was, it was easy for people to pick on me because I wouldn't defend myself or it's kind of the odd one out maybe. Even when I was in middle school, so maybe seven years after, eight years after this time where I completely didn't speak, the kids who I had in kindergarten would say to me, oh, hey, you remember when you used to not talk in school? And that, that was a very strange situation as well. So there was very... I, I think I was fortunate that I started therapy very early, that I wasn't completely like nonverbal when I was a teenager in school. I think I was very lucky about that. We were able to find a therapist. But when I was, because I, we were all kids, it was, people didn't take that much notice to it. Mm. That's great. And that's something I love about young children. <clears throat> they I quite often I find that children, um, the child's essay may have a best friend, you know, say, say eight years old, they may have to have a best friend for three, four years, and they've never had a conversation, yet they're, yeah. they're friends, and they, they play together, and they, they like each other, it's quite um, amazing, actually, um, at, that, at that young age, when it's, um, of course, there are situations where bullying does occur, but it's quite amazing when children actually just accept one another for who just yeah for where they little are kid, not, I think yeah. little kids sometimes will go on with a lot as long as you tell them so like the teachers would say oh just leave them alone or something and if a five-year-old would just usually they would just go along with it yeah yeah they might it might be just like innocent comments like why doesn't yeah. he talk why well, it was more of that yeah but then when they're told by the adult then more, hopefully you know <laughs> they, they then stop um yeah that's great Okay, so um, so then on outside of school situation. So, it, um, were, first of all, were there any extended family members that you didn't talk to or family friends? And if so, how did they react to your selective mutism? My my parents always had to always liked having people over, so we often had big parties, and a lot of times I would get very overwhelmed by it, or shut down, or hide somewhere. And, but I think pe people were, of course not at first, because I don't think anybody is accepting of finding this out at first, but at least I don't think a lot of people are. But as time gone, gone on, people just understood or started to understand. But people would still be kind of annoyed, like if I didn't greet them when they came or wouldn't give them a hug when they came. Um, or if my parents were going to an event and it, it was too challenging for me and I didn't go, I think people would be annoyed by it. But it wasn't, it wasn't as difficult for me as school stuff. So that, that by itself was kind of helpful in this, in this regard. Mm -hmm. But it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. And I was fortunate enough about that, that people didn't make a big deal out of it at home. And did your parents need to educate people and let them know that Jonathan suffers with selective mutismal social anxiety? Or um, was that like the fact that you had the, the diagnoses help others to understand? Or do you think they just kind of got it? That is a very good question. And I do not know the answer. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. When I was diagnosed, I was five. So I don't really know what my parents yeah. do with people. And I never really asked them. But I, I do know that at school, 
when we first started, when I first got there and I didn't have this diagnosis, the teachers were, were much more strict with me they, because they thought I was doing this on purpose and the school was not very accommodative. But once I did get the diagnosis and my doctor actually came into the school building to, to work with me and he trained them and he spoke to them, then the school became so much more helpful and mm-hmm. more accepting. So in that respect, the diagnosis helped tremendously. Mm-hmm. But outside the house, I'm not actually sure. Yeah, no, that, that's really interesting because there can be so many misconceptions and especially if school staff assume that child is being defiant or stubborn, and then of course yeah. it affects how they approach the child. And so how, so, um, that, so that kind of leads on to the next question. In terms of school, um, how did school staff approach you generally? Yeah, at the beginning, I remember them being kind of mean and not very nice about it, but I think they just thought I was this bratty kid who didn't want to speak to them or didn't want to follow instructions, didn't want to listen to anything they had to say. So in that regards, I kind of understand why they weren't so accepting or lenient or whatever. But after my doctor came to school and, and worked with them and explained things and he got permission to actually do like therapy with me in the classroom. So he would come into my kindergarten and work with me while school was going on before school. So once that happened, they became much more accepting and they became nice to me and they were more accommodative of my anxiety. Great. Oh, it's a shame that we need to get to that level because not all yeah. children and parents may have access to uh, specialists coming into the school. Yeah. It's such a shame that and it's required. But um, again, but hope- sorry, no, go ahead. Again, this was 20 years ago. Exactly. So I, I would hope that teachers are more knowledgeable about kids with anxiety issues or even if they don't know selective mutism, they should know will know something about anxiety or what might be yeah. going on. So I think, I, I hope it's different now. I think it's different. Yeah. And that, you know, YouTube exists. There are videos, just like short clips about what selective yeah. mutism is that parents can now pass on to teachers, which I'm, I'm guessing 20 years ago, your parents didn't have access to. So um, yeah, so the situation is better, although still more can be done. <laughs> um, so I'm really intrigued to hear your journey of how you actually started to, talk and you know your journey of yeah. overcoming SM um, in these different situations so if you're happy to share that that would be really, really yeah. great. so it's probably not all that exciting but <laughs> it is so, for the viewers <laughs> they're waiting for this moment to hear so when I when I was little we we saw one doctor and of course he misdiagnosed me and then we moved on to somebody else and they misdiagnosed me at or we didn't know it was misdiagnosis, but the therapy wasn't working. So um, one of the guys was actually deaf, which is absolutely, I think, fascinating that a deaf guy was working with a child who couldn't speak. Um, the therapy didn't work, but I just, I thought that was pretty hysterical. And I didn't, I, I didn't think it was hysterical at the time, but I, I do now. And so another, you tried, so there were various different uh, therapies that you tried, yeah. that your parents tried that didn't and just work. Nothing and happened. just out of interest, what kind of, approach did they take do you remember the ones that didn't work I don't remember specifically I know one was more just like play therapy so just playing with the person not in any which I know is part of like PCIT SM that people do now to help with selective mutism it's play but it's more like goal directed and it's more for a purpose this was just play to play and to become comfortable and that didn't really get anywhere I'm not sure what the other two people did I do know like one doctor told my parents that the reason I wasn't eating in school was because they had food for me when I got home. So they shouldn't feed me when I got home from school. So oh I think God. that was one of the reasons why we left one of the doctors. Oh and my I'm not really God. sure about the third. That is, oh my gosh. <laughs> yes, very strange things. Well, wow. okay, um, so what did work? <laughs> what did work? So eventually after a few months of this in kindergarten, and I just, I wasn't moving from underneath lights, which we went down to, I live in New York and we were only a few hours away from the NYU Child Study Center. So we went there and I got a diagnosis finally, the right diagnosis. And I met this doctor who took on my case, which is Dr. Kurtz, who I know you know, and other people might've seen them on other YouTube videos, Dr. Stephen Kurtz. And he started working with me and 
now is called PCI TSM, which is, it's hard to explain exactly, but we worked kind of, simplest way to explain it is you do extremely, extremely baby steps in getting what you want. And we had a reward system in place. So as an example, um, going into school, we went before school started, there was absolutely nobody in the room. It would just be me and my mom and the doctor in the classroom and there'd be nobody else there. And we'd focus on kind of small things like playing a game or like just walking around the, the, the room to become comfortable. And because the speech would come after that there was some at least comfort in the situation. Another thing we did was we set up a reward system. So whenever I did something that was anxiety provoking and I succeeded with it, I would get these little, um, they were like dollar bills, but they had pictures of Batman on them and we'd call them brave bucks. And so I guess I was kind of motivated by money or something. I don't know. But I would get these, these, these rewards with each goal that I had and achieved. And at the end, I would turn in those brave bucks for uh, a toy for my hamster. I guess I was also motivated by that. So the easiest way to explain it, we broke everything down into the babiest and smallest of steps, kind of worked with me in knowing what I was like able to do for, at the most basic level from at the most basic level i need to be able to get into the classroom before i could even speak with anybody um and i know you've done videos on like sliding in and fade-ins it was really all of that process so before even we started in the school building of course we started in the doctor's office so me and my mom in the doctor's office playing the doctor progressively getting closer to us as i was verbal with my mom and us me playing and getting comfortable and slowly getting acclimated to this, this fear response that I was having. I think that's really all it is, is allowing the child to become acclimated to the fear. And it wasn't about removing fears from my life or anything like that. It was about approaching the fear in a more manageable way. I hope that explains some of it, but it's, it's kind of a very complicated process. But once you see it, oh, that makes complete sense. Why would you just force, try to get the kid to talk to somebody in the classroom that they can't even walk into? So it was all about breaking things down into what could be done now? And then what's the next challenge? Like just the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest bit above that. Yeah, that's a really good ex explanation. Just that making the um, each step achievable for the child. And, you know, you mentioned rewards there and parents or you know, staff even sometimes make the mistake where they say they focus on um, an unachieved, the goal itself and they offer a big reward. So they say, you know, if you talk to your teacher at school, we'll go on holiday. And that is the wrong way to do it because it's yeah. not within the child's reach and they're just going to feel rubbish that they can't do it and they go get this big reward. So that's the wrong way to do it. The right way to do it, as you've just described, is breaking it down into these mini, mini steps, these really achievable steps for the child and so they can um, reach that goal. And you, as you say, you become desensitised to that step and you know, you're know you practising um, within what the child can do. So if the child can't talk in the busy classroom, we're practicing in the empty classroom first, or even practicing mm -hmm. in a room away from the classroom first. Um, so making it achievable for the child. So yeah. that's great. But Exactly. And so we started out with, like the teacher would sit at her desk while me and my, well, after me and my mom started talking, the teacher would sit at the desk and then continue talking and she would progressively get closer and then she would join in all these things after like successive verbalizations, not just her getting closer, like it was her getting closer after I was successful at this goal of, of speaking. And then I think we literally did like one by one with the, with the kids about me being able to speak with them. And then after I was able to speak with kids like individually, I'd be able to speak to more of them. Another thing we did was actually showed a video of me speaking to the class. So the whole class was doing show and tell. Of course, I couldn't do my show and tell, but we videotaped it at home and then showed it to the kids in school. Even then, it was extremely difficult. I actually like ran out of the room while this was happening, but that was the first time that the kids heard me speak. And I think it was good for them to see that I was able to talk and I could talk, that it kind of took some of the expectations away, possibly. Um, 
So that I, I think was helpful, even though in the moment it was incredibly difficult. I like my parents were there and I punched my dad to get out of the room because I was like, need to get out of there immediately. Yeah. Would, do you think it would have been, in hindsight, do you think it would have been better if that was shown without you actually at, in the room at the time? I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. I, but I, I do think that be, even though I did run away from it, I, I guess I kind of got through it. So in that regard, it was, I didn't die from the, the scenario. And they, the, the goal of it wasn't for me to do anything. It was just for me to stand there while the video is being shown. So I'm not sure. Mm. Mm. I don't know if it would be different either way. I yeah. just know that it was very difficult. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Um, and I suppose maybe even just for the viewers, <laughs> um, that sometimes breaking that down in steps can be useful in terms of the chart, um, it being shown, the video maybe just showing to the teacher by themselves first, and then maybe just the, you know, one child and then bringing in other children step by step. Um, yeah. and maybe you can SM not there, and then maybe them kind of in the background. So we can also break even that down into steps potentially. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So how far, how old were you when you were um, when you, this intervention took place? I was five. I was oh, so five. kindergarten. Yeah. Ah, so that's when he he actually came into your school when you were five yeah. years old. Ah, okay. And how long did it, maybe you don't remember how long was the process between you know you starting to then talk to your teacher and talking in school? Yeah. Um, miraculously, I would say it was probably only a few months because I started working with him in March. And I remember, I think before the end of the year, I think I had at least spoken to my teacher and I had at least spoken to a few of the kids, maybe one or two other kids. I didn't, I hadn't like, spoken to everybody, but, and I remember I had sat down, I had eaten snack. Lunch was very difficult because we we're going into this other like lunchroom, um, but snack we had in our classroom. And I remember being able to do that. So once we actually found the doctor who knew what he was doing and was able to help me, things actually moved pretty quickly, actually. Um, and I remember, I remember meeting my first grade teacher before I left for before kindergarten year ended. I picked out my seat. And I would do those kinds of things. And so maybe by second grade, I had spoken to everybody. Wow. But the initial like push over the hump of not being able to move or do anything, that kind of got over after just a few months of working with him in the school building and in his office. Yeah, it's quite amazing, really, that, you know, especially in the early stages for parents, um, it can feel like, um, like there's no light at the end of the tunnel, but they just, especially if they don't have a specialist in SM who knows what they're talking about, about guiding them, or they don't have access to resources that just, you know, if they don't know what to do, basically, it can feel like an impossible situation yeah. to get out of. But actually, as you say, if you've got somebody who knows what they're doing, or you've, you've got access to resources that can help you, and you put a plan in place, children often do make steps forward pretty quickly. It's yeah. quite amazing. If we do the right it approach, is. it works. <laughs> yeah, I know people who do the wrong approach and they go years and years and years with no progress at all. Yeah. And it's amazing in We Speak that kids make so much progress in, in five days or any of these camps um, because there is like this formula that exists that people have been working on for the past 20 years, 25 years. And um, it's amazing how well it, it can work at times. Yeah. Doctor, at the time, I was actually Dr. Kurtz's like first official patient with selective mutism. So even then, he wasn't an expert in it, but he had worked a lot with kids with child anxiety and kids who have oppositional behaviors, I believe. And he kind of developed this, this system, I guess, in, in working with me and work, starting to work with other kids. So I'm not sure how he figured out what he needed to do, but he was able to yeah it's amazing how it works and actually when I work with parents quite a lot of the time if it's not working we can almost be detectives and figure out why it's not working yeah um, and then if you make those tweaks and changes then the child does start to make steps forward with talking and they're usually not it's not working because we're it the program isn't consistent or you know it's not being done in the right way um but small changes can make big differences oh absolutely the tiniest and tiniest of details, you'd be amazed how much these things um, make a big difference. I was doing one of these camps and this kid had trouble speaking in his, in his full voice. And depending on how much I literally moved my chair towards him 
would depend yeah. on how much he was able to use his, his full voice. Even like this compared to facing right like this was made a difference in how much he was able to, to do yeah. this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just, yeah, exactly. Proximity or even rotation of your body, like small things like that can make a big difference. Um, okay, so I'm really interested to talk about medication because I know that in your book, um, and by the way, for the viewers, I will put the link to this book in the description below so you can find it easily. In your book, Thank you mentioned you. that you um, did actually have anti-anxiety medication to, to help you with SM. Now, just a quick disclaimer, <laughs> because medication is not prescribed for children with SM usually in the UK, and we're definitely not, through this video, promoting medication. If um, this is Jonathan's unique personal experience that he's about to share of it, and if um, if you are interested in exploring it further, then of course find a professional who is qualified and experienced in medication. <laughs> so just that quick disclaimer. But yes. Jonathan, yeah, please share your experience of medication. In what ways was it helpful or not helpful for you? Were there any side effects? How long were you on it? Yeah. Yeah. How, uh, yeah, just generally the process of weaning off. I'm really interested to hear more about this because this is not an area that we, you know, discuss a lot in the UK. So I started medication in second grade. So I guess I was seven or eight. I, this was after kind of the initial push of the selecting changes in treatment with my with my doctor and I made substantial progress by second grade I was able to uh, pretty much do everything a normal kid would do besides I wouldn't like raise my hand or I wouldn't wouldn't raise my hand wouldn't like do school uh, presentations I wouldn't um, eat lunch or gym or music but in all other ways I was kind of normal but things became more difficult as I guess the responsibilities of a student became more challenging so Things like I wouldn't want to turn my homework into the teacher because I didn't want her to see it happening. And I would get like very frustrated with my inability to, to do certain things. So I think when I was little, I both had an inability to do things, but I also didn't want to. But I think after with treatment, I started to develop this desire to, but my abilities didn't match up to that at times. And I would get very frustrated. And my anxiety started to become a little bit more severe where I started to not want to go to, or even more so not want to go to school or fight going to school, a lot of school appointments. So this is where, I, this is when I got the social anxiety diagnosis as well. So, and, so just to clarify, you had the intervention when you were five years old and that helped you with talking to specific people um, at school, you increased the talking, but there were still areas that you struggled with. Yes. Like handing in your homework, actually approaching the teacher, putting your hand up. So those higher level goals, I suppose, are yes. harder things still existed. Yeah. Okay. Those and higher then, level challenges were, were much more difficult and they started, they started to not become as easy to approach as the, the lower goals were. Mm. And we, we had gotten somewhere and we were kind of stuck in this plateau for a while. And my doctor recommended that we see somebody about potentially using medication because he was, I don't know how it works in the UK, but he's a psychologist. He's not allowed to prescribe, but we have to go to somebody else for that. And it was a big decision for my parents, as I would imagine it's a big decision for anybody to put a seven-year-old on certain medication. And my parents did a lot of research and a lot of talking to a lot of different people. We had a friend who was a doctor and we spoke to him, a medical doctor, not a psychologist doctor. And Eventually, we decided to do it, and I started on, um, I guess, pretty low dose of Prozac. And we didn't like see changes immediately, but slowly, I would say, it started to make my general anxiety level decrease. The way I like to explain it is, if you ask a kid with selective mutism to raise his hand in class or talk to somebody or initiate a conversation with somebody, it feels like you're asking. Felt like you were asking me to jump over a 10 foot wall. And I would say with the right, I kind of think of therapy as scaffolding and support. I think you could get the kid over the wall or the kid could get himself over the wall. But with the medication, it didn't make me like speak freely, but it made that wall like a five foot wall instead, where the therapy became more doable and the challenges became more manageable. Um, 
that I was able to take on these challenges more easily. So we didn't like stop behavioral therapy when I started the medication. It was a combination approach. And I'm not sure how long I was on the medication for initially, but I was on it for a few years. I didn't really have that many side effects. We did tell my teachers, like, if I need to take a nap, they were, if they knew about this and knew that I might need to go to the nurse or something, if I felt strange. But we, I, there were no real, like, major side effects that I remember. And I don't remember also being not into the idea. I think what helped was that I always knew I had selective images, and my parents were very honest with me about it. And I was always in the conversations about what our next goals were going to be and how things were going to move forward. So I was on it for a few years. And once I was like at a place where I thought, I, I guess not me, but we thought I was comfortable, we kind of weaned off the medication. And I was on it for two or three years. And I found that it was very helpful for me. And when things became more challenging again, when I was transferring from elementary school to middle school, so that was from fifth grade to sixth grade, I also, I went back on the medication because we knew not that things were challenging, but we knew that things would become challenging as I transitioned. So again, that happened and I was on it for a year or two and then I went off. And then I started having more difficulties in eighth grade because I had a lot of difficulties making friends. And again, I had a lot of school avoidance come back up and things again became more difficult. So then I went back on the medication and then I was on it for a few years and went back off. And this kind of process repeated again, high school where things became more difficult and a lot of school avoidance. And I started again. And I even went back on when I was transitioning to college. Not, and also again, it's not that things were difficult, but we knew that things would become difficult and we wanted to prepare for it by using the medication. And I weaned off um, when I was a senior. So my fourth year of, of college and I haven't been on since, but I'm, I'm not opposed to the idea of going back on if something came up again. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I don't know how typical my medication journey is about doing like this on and off process. I know some people stay on it for long periods of time, but the way we did it was we used it as like another tool in our toolbox of when things become difficult, when things became difficult or when we thought things would become difficult that I would use the medication to help with that. Yeah, I see. And yeah, my understanding of it is that exactly that you don't use medication as a standalone treatment it's alongside the therapy the behavioral interventions and just as you would kind of um come on it in a slow you know start with low yes. dose and then gradually build up is that how it was for you that low dose exactly I, when i was little because i was so little we were on i was on a very low dose but i remember specifically when i started it again in college what we did we started with one dose and then was on it for a month and moved up was on there for a month and moved up and I was on that dose for a few years and then we did the reverse process to get off so we cut it we cut the dose by a third we stayed with that for a month cut the dose by a third again stayed with that for a month and then I was off it mm, so just step by step in the same way and, and I suppose I, of yeah. course the doctor is monitoring you through the yes process. I didn't have any real side effects at all I would say um like getting the first hump of getting on the medication maybe I was a little restless or like I would find my leg would like go up and down sometimes. I, that, I was a little bit restless, I would say. But after a few weeks, that kind of went away and it wasn't like persistent when I was on the medication. I, I had the side effect. And when I was little, I don't remember any, any side effects either. Sure. And of course, you mentioned you had the diagnosis of social anxiety as well as the selective mutism. So I suppose that the medication wasn't solely targeting the SM, but both yeah. diagnoses as well. All, I would say all aspects of the anxiety that I was experiencing because that, yeah, later on I was, the speech wasn't the issue. It was, it was more higher level goals, like we said. So being comfortable, being able to present in class or being able to raise my hand in class or making friends, initiating, eating lunch, um, music class, things that were more difficult. Yeah. And do you think that, because you said that um, you had the therapy when you're five years old, then about seven years old, they started the, you started the medication um, to work on those more difficult challenges. So after you started the medication, were you then able to put your hand up in class and eat in the lunch hall and do those harder things? Um, as a result, like, was there a clear for you? Did you notice that you started medication and suddenly you could do these things that you couldn't do previously? 
I would, I would say yes, but just that it wasn't sudden. It wasn't like I started the medication and a few weeks later, I was able to do these things. It was that I started the medication a few weeks later, this one challenge that maybe that was a little, just a little bit above what I was able to do. I was now able to do that, which led to these other things coming down the line. It just, yeah. it, we didn't like change the goal structure and we didn't have to, we didn't like bunny hop over things because things became so easy. It was that the, the, the hierarchy just became more manageable to work mm -hmm. with. Yes, that makes sense. So thank you for sharing all of that. That's very useful for, um, for us, as I said. <laughs> it's not an area that we really explore here. So <laughs> obviously you're an adult now. Do you feel as though you have overcome selective mutism? Um, I would say like diagnosis wise, I would say yes. I don't meet the diagnosis anymore and there's no areas of my life where I do, but I do, I do still get anxiety even somewhat severely at times. And those things all have to do with, with social aspects. And I've kind of accepted the fact that that's going to be that way. And I've learned ways to manage it and my friends know about it and my friends my family knows about it and we're all pretty aware of what's going on at times. So I would say, no, I don't, I would say I overcame selective mutism, but I, I do still identify very strongly with, with having anxiety and it impacting my life in some ways. But I, tr I my, my biggest thing is I try to not let it interfere with things. So even though I do experience anxiety at times, like going to a restaurant, I still make myself do these things. And even though I might have plans with a friend and I really want to cancel because I'm very anxious about it. I, I've been in therapy long enough to know that that's my anxiety saying that, and I need to do these things. And I do it kind of as an exposure on purpose for myself. And sometimes I will like purposely do things because I know they're anxiety provoking, even though I may not really want to inside like motivationally. So you challenge yourself to, do things rather than yeah. oh, your default would be to obviously avoid the thing that makes you uncomfortable but you kind of go against that and you challenge yeah. yourself to do it anyway and um, yeah dr kurtz has a great youtube video um called like living and exposure lifestyle or something mm -hmm. and i think that's really great and it's mostly on like people who are currently in in therapy and working towards their psychic mutism but still today i would say it's, i think identify with that because so many of the things I do, I do like purposely as exposure for myself, because I know that if I don't challenge myself in certain ways that I will regress and mm -hmm. I do find myself regressing. And I did like between school years, even the, just that three month summer break away from school, I would regress. And I try to be aware of that very much. Sure. Sure. And I suppose even for people watching who may not have selected me to some you, whenever we have, like, don't practice doing something of course it becomes yeah. more challenging just like with the lockdowns you know yeah. even myself after not seeing friends for a long time it was a bit of a you know an uncomfortable situation to suddenly go into social situations again after such a long break because you get comfortable not doing these things so exactly. it, it's, it makes sense but um yeah you know, I, I think it's the exact same thing and just imagine the person like having a, a, a very very strong tendency to being avoidant of those things so not doing them for a while and then being forced to do it again can be very jarring. And it was at times. Of course, yeah. So what would you, be your key message for people who may currently have selective mutism? Um, I think I had a lot of difficulties like accepting this fact that this was something I was living with. And at times it was, it was very tiring how much energy things could take, like going to school or just like talking to somebody could be very, could be very um, tiring. So I think a lot of what needed, what I needed to do when I was younger was like accept this fact and understand it and just try to work every day towards, towards something and just acknowledge and accept the fact that it is going to be a lot of work to get over and you really need to put yourself out there and really take it on because it's not just going to go away. There are plenty of times where I wished it would have just kind of go, go away or I procrastinated in doing a certain thing because it was very difficult. But as much as I did push myself when I was little, I think I still think I could have done more. People always think they can do more certain good things, but 
it takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of hard work. And I think you, my advice to people is really to go at it and really take this on as a challenge and just think about it as this game you're playing with yourself, which is why I, my book is called Learning to Play the Game because it's, it's really, I kind of like to think about this as, as a game that I have to play with myself. Um, and it's a challenge and I can't let like, my anxiety win. I have to kind of work towards it. So I, I think that's my advice. And, but also be kind to yourself. Don't push yourself too much because things can become like, too much. And yeah. That's great. Thank you. That's, that's really, really a great message. And what would be your key message for friends of the person? I suppose, you know, children, <laughs> friends, <laughs> child friends, and, um, and add, you know, yeah, friends, peers of the person. What would your key message for them be? Um, I think it's difficult with little kids as, as we kind of said before that they don't really understand and it, they kind of just accept that. So I guess this message is more for older like teenagers, friends, but um, it's just to, like be accepting of the uniqueness of maybe somebody who has selective mutism and understand that certain things can be very difficult and um, it may, it's, most likely nothing to do with you as the friend and has most likely if there's a difficulty it has nothing to do with with the person it's more so a challenge that they are working with and a difficulty that's like in the environment or difficulty of just just being around other people and i think lots of friends and people might like take offense to certain things even not taking initiative with 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 hanging out or or talking so I think it's important to not, for the person to, to, to think of it as not, it's not about them. Mm -hmm. It's not me as a friend or me in a certain way. So I think that's helpful for them. But also like, for, I was able to tell like my college friends and they kind of knew and some of my high school friends knew like later on, much later on. And there were, t there were times in my college when I was out with people where I just had to walk away for a few minutes. So I think that like to understand that concept and um, knowing that there might be times where I need to calm down or it might be times where a person's not up for hanging out. It's, it's not really reflective on friendship or reflective on the friend, I would say. Great, thank you. And what would be your key message for school staff? Um, don't tell the kids' parents that they're never going to get better. Uh, don't tell <laughs> all those things that I, I mentioned that probably shouldn't have happened. Don't do that. That's a joke, of course. Um, but I think just trying to be very supportive and also, I know teachers are extremely busy with things, but trying to help with these challenges in any way they, that they can, whether it's they see them being, so, being social or they see them speaking or just like give them a high five for, 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 for doing these things. My teachers kind of knew of this kind of reward system and they would give me brave bucks too. I, of course, that depends on how old the person is because you don't want a 13 year old or a 16 year old with a teacher coming up and giving them brave bucks. But I think being very supportive, but also trying to push them at times. I think sometimes I think teachers might be pushed too much, not really understanding the challenges, but if they're pushing in the right way, that's incredibly helpful because they're with the teacher six, seven hours a day. So having them be part of this, this treatment or with this therapy can be incredibly helpful. And I had some fantastic teachers who were able to do that. Um, yeah. yeah exactly it's all about doing it in the right way as you say because if you know if they're doing it in the wrong way it could have the complete opposite effect and mm -hmm. um, you know in an ideal world there would be regular consultations with the parent the teacher and you know the specialist for, um, in, the, in the perfect world to review how's the child doing and what approach are we taking right now yeah. what you know what you know um a meeting to just review and have really clear um really a clear structured intervention rather than the teacher just trying something random one day and something random the next day it should be really kind of systematic exactly. really. yeah great okay and what would be your key message for parents who have a child with selective mutism i think that's what i'm most passionate about because there are lots of these Facebook pages and I, and I see parents talk about this and talk 
like talk about the challenges they're working with. And my, my biggest message of all is don't wait. Do not wait to, to seek help. Do not wait um, just hoping that things are going to get better because if a kid's five and he's not talking in school, I don't know like what the actual odds are, but the odds are that they're just going to get better by themselves is I think is kind of remote. And all the difficulties that they're gonna have in school are just gonna build and build and build. And it's so much easier to work with other five-year-olds, like five-year-old peers are much more accepting than a 13, 14, 15-year-old peers who are already in their friend groups, who are already doing other things. They're going to the mall or they're going to Starbucks with other kids. And your child is going to miss out on so much, so much. And if you're not working with them on this, I think, I don't, I don't mean to be like overly um, prescriptive or threatening or something with parents, but I really don't want people to wait because there's so much that the kid is going to miss out on and things can get, are going to just build and become so difficult. And my biggest message to parents is don't wait, work on it, work on it. Like this is your full-time job. And I know parents have their own full-time jobs, but I, I think this is the most important thing that you can do for your child. The most important thing in their entire life is to help them get through this because otherwise their life is not going to exist because I've met kids who are 21 and are still dealing with selective mutism. And the only thing that they do is talk to their parents and work for the dad's business or work at home because they can't do anything else. And I don't want anybody to have that experience. And just to kind of um, put a positive spin on it as well, yes. you know, there's Please do. not rocket science as well. You know, we can, um, it's, it's about not waiting, taking action. And it's not like you have, it's a really difficult, um, it's time consuming. Yes. <laughs> That's what it can be. It can be time consuming, researching and putting it all into action. But the actual exposures and the practices are not particularly difficult it's just about doing it yeah and i lots of parents who have kids with sm usually have some anxiety themselves and i know this can be very challenging and it's a lot of times it's taxing for the parent to work with this and um it can anxiety provoking to take the kid out and doing these things what are other people going to think but it just it really needs to be done and has to find a way to do it and the rule the best the best thing about it is seeing the kids succeed with these what more joy could you have in seeing your kid who hasn't been able to speak to a single person in years, months, and now is able to do it? There's no better reward, I probably on earth, than I being able to see this happen. I think the main challenge that parents have, uh, with the parents that I've you know worked with, um, when they first get in touch, is that they want to help their child, they want to do it, but they just don't know how. And yeah. luckily. But nowadays there are so many more resources out there so um you know like personally i have a youtube channel full of videos i've got yeah. online courses there's books there's other books if you um I, you know if you just go on to amazon and write selective mutism now thank god yeah. there's lots of books out there um so i think it's just about empowering the parents to just know what yeah. to do and if you can get in touch with a specialist who understands selective mutism then that can you know help even more because yeah. of course um, you know it, it's a lot easier when you're guided. But if, if you can't Definitely. do that, there are resources out there, YouTube yeah. videos, books, just to get the, the tools. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Selective Mutism Association in, in the US has has free webinars, has a YouTube channel that you can go on. They have new webinars mm -hmm. every month, every other month. A lot of practices, I know at least in the US, have their own YouTube channel. So Dr. Kurtz has his own YouTube channel, his practice, Child Mind Institute. There's lots of free resources you can get. Um, I hear great things about this book. It's like the Parents Field Guide for Selective Mutism or something like that that you can buy that I hear great things about. That's really step-by-step -step process about, mm -hmm. about what you can do. Um, and it, it doesn't mean spending lots of money to find a therapist. You can work on these things yeah. yourself with the kid. There's a Selective Mutism resource manual, which is mm -hmm. um, very, very popular in the UK as well, um, which is, you know, a real comprehensive guide with lots of um, information. It will take time to read through. Uh, yes. so it's just investing that time and energy to just, you know, go through. But there's so much out there. And as we said, even just videos online. Yeah. And 
the parents are watching this video, <laughs> they're probably already very, very invested. Um, great. Okay. Um, so if you, Jonathan, could go back to your younger self and tell, you know, younger Jonathan something, what would that be? What would, what would you tell your younger self? Um, it's going to get better, but it's going to be a lot of work. And as I said before, just accepting that fact and like putting your whole weight into it is going to pay off so much because the rewards are going to be fantastic. Um, finally being able to make friends, finally being able to keep friends, finally being able to go do things with them outside of school um, is incredibly rewarding after not doing them for 10, 15 years, not being able to, to actually do those things. Um, also being kind to yourself because sometimes things will become too challenging and there might be something that you want to do and you feel like you can't. But just understanding that that's okay and there are going to be setbacks and there are going to be days where it feels like it's never going to happen. Like there's no way that things will get better. I still think that today, even though I have 20 years of experience working on this, knowing that things have gotten better because at a, there was a time where I couldn't speak to a single person outside of my house. Um, all of those things, being kind to yourself, acknowledging that it's going to be so much work, but really, really putting in the work and um, knowing that things will be difficult, but there's still ways to push through and you can push through and things can get better. Great, thank you. And I suppose that's also, um, you know, talking to the social anxiety as well, you know, the SM and the social anxiety. Um, yeah, it's so hard, but the, 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 um, the benefit the payoff. is worth yeah. it, I suppose. So my last question <laughs> um, is, so looking back on this whole experience that you've had, would you say that having selective mutism has had a positive impact in any way on who you are today? I'd say definitely. Um, even though I've kind of been very uh, passionate about this thing about parents and making sure kids are really get better, because that's really what I, I want to see is kids to not have to struggle with this. Um, and positively, I think just being able to advocate for these kids and being able to do interviews like this, or I wrote this book, I'm working on a, on a new book that's more of a fictional story. Um, being able to talk at conferences about this has all been so rewarding. I've spoken to so many parents who, who really um, like hearing my story and can identify with this and want to hear about what their kids are going through. So all of that has been incredibly rewarding and I, um, I wouldn't trade that for anything. And I also, I also think it has made me more receptive of the challenges that other people are going through. Um, more understanding of, of mental health conditions. I originally wasn't going into the mental health field, but I've kind of pivoted now and I'm working on that as my master's degree in pursuing psychology. So there's lots of, I don't think I would be the person today without it. Um, and I really, even though the journey was, was difficult, I'm still glad I went through it. I think it's taught me a lot about persistence fighting for what you believe to be true, knowing that just because this, the principal at my school, this position of authority told my parents that I was never gonna get better just because somebody says something or prescribes something doesn't mean that's really the case. Finding things out for yourself, practicing. Um, I think it's, it's made me more of like an action oriented person, I think because my whole life I've had to like deliberately plan things out and deliberately take steps to, to, to work on this. So there are lots of ways that I, I find, I find the positive in it. And if I could go back and make me not have this, I don't think I would. Wow. Even though it was very difficult. Wow. So inspiring. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That's amazing. Just that is last words. If I could go back and make myself not have it, I wouldn't like it gave me goosebumps um it's just 
yeah amazing and actually parents sometimes even tell me parents who you know we get to the end of the road and they their child is talking they say you know this was actually in a crazy way a blessing my child has overcome something so early in their life yeah. that this they've now got they, they, they've now got this everything uh, else in life because um, so small and so so non non essential non um, not important from if you think about the kid going from not literally not being able to what makes them be human is being social and being able to talk to people and going from not being able to do that to now being able to do that and live a normal life is just it's incredibly rewarding yeah amazing thank you so much for sharing your thank story thank you for having me um, yeah that thank was you. An amazing um, video. So thank you so much. And just a reminder to everybody, Jonathan's book, Learning to Play the Game, My Journey Through Silence. I'll put the link to this in the comments section or in the description below. I'll also put a couple of links to some of my videos, which I think might be useful on some of the yeah. topics we've covered today, like a video that you could show to your child's class, um, a video about not waiting for your child to overcome selective abuse, and some of the other, other links um, that might be useful. I'll also link those down below. So thank you everybody for watching this video. I really hope that you found it useful. Please remember to like, subscribe to this YouTube channel and also go over to the Competent Children's Selective Mutism and Therapy Facebook page where I regularly share lots of resources all about SM. So yeah, it'd be great to have you there as well. So thank you for watching and have a lovely rest of the day. Bye.